Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. Glad you could join us tonight. I'm going to share screen, get us oriented to our conversation before I introduce our guest presenter. So tonight is a book chat, a book chat on the book Tomatoes and Peppers, a metaphorical tale for anyone who cares about kids. And we are thrilled to welcome our guest presenter, um, this book's author, Matt Mulligan. But before that, let's get us oriented. So um, Brain Club, of course, our intentionally created education space for the collective ABB community for purposes of providing education about ABB's approach to neuro-inclusive community culture. Brain Club is about bringing people together to develop a shared vision of what's possible and to contribute to systems change by promoting new ways of thinking and being with the idea that then um, you experience something here, you go out into your world, and that is what you are expecting to feel and expecting of, 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 of the world to uh, deliver for you. And that's how we will collectively change the world. This is a place uh, where we're intending for you to, to, to feel safe, um, to experience how culture can be different. And in many instances, it's about learning and unlearning together. And though All Brains Belong has a variety of different types of programs, um, uh, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to make personal or individualized requests or address individualized needs. This is a place where we invite you to explore today's big picture theme, where you can share ideas or reflections related to, the, to, to tonight's topic. All paths to participation are welcome here. Uh, you can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the screen or any of those neuronormative constructs. So feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or any anything that needs doing. And remembering that observation is a valid form of participation. Um, all formats of communication are welcome here. Um, we will talk about our the modified structure we use whenever we welcome guest presenters, just like last week that we'll get to in, in a couple of slides. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this a safe experience for all participants, we prioritize the group's access needs over that of the individual. Access needs, what's that? Access needs being anything required for full and meaningful participation in one's life or community. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And there's all different types of access needs um, that play out not just in Brain Club, but in everyday life. And you'll hear a lot about, if you're new to Brain Club, you'll hear a, a lot about access needs um, in most Brain Club weeks. Um, but the, the, the access need that I will uh, bring up uh, to begin with, um, are around our technology of our Zoom platform. So closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. That's my visual support to actually open the chat where I can see it, and now I can see it. And I've missed a whole lot. Hello, everybody. And speaking of the chat, um, the chat is uh, one example where we have often conflicting access needs. While many community members, the chat is a way of accessing this program. It's a way of communicating without mouth words. It's a way of getting ideas out without burdening working memory. It's a way of participating asynchronously. You can take your time and think about things and share ideas as they come, even if the topic has changed. Um, it's also a way of having direct um, interaction between community members. And there are also many community members for whom the chat is not only distracting, um, but the visual clutter is dysregulating um, and, and who may even have a startle response when it, when it pops up, especially when it moves really quickly. So um, our best advice to navigate conflicting access needs in the chat, um, if you're someone who the chat bothers you, um, try one of two things. One is when the, the chat pops up the first time, try not 
closing it because though the, the, the words will change, it won't pop more than once if you leave it open. Alternatively, you can try to disable the pop-ups to begin with. And that involves looking at the toolbar of your Zoom and where you have the, the speech bubble icon for chat. There's a little up caret. Click on that. It'll show the word show chat preview with a check mark. Tap on that check mark and it'll go away. And hopefully you will not have any more pop-ups. Okay. Um, last bit of access uh, related um, technology stuff. Um, you can put your questions in the chat for our presenter whenever you think of them. You don't need to wait for a certain part. You can put questions in the chat. Some of the questions that the rest of our ABB team might, um, you know, answer as we go so that, you know, questions that don't necessarily need our presenters uh, input on. And then at the end, I'll choose a selection of questions to direct to our guest presenter at the end um, of, our, of our session. Um, so so we're, we're not going to take mouth word questions today. Before we begin, I also want to preview next month's Brain Club. Next month's theme, Small Changes, Big Impact. And we've got a lot, a lot of uh, very, very exciting um, Brain Club uh, sessions planned for you. One of which, uh, save the date for this one, on Tuesday, June 11th, is our next special event that it takes place during Brain Club, but it's a, a, a bigger special event. Um, called Practical Strategies for Neuroinclusive Healthcare. So we're like, we're like pulling back the curtain here and like showing you what we do in our healthcare delivery and, and, and what works as determined by our patients. So it's not like stuff we made up, but it's like the co-creation experience um, that, that uh, our community um, has, has uh, created with us. And we are very, very uh, grateful to our sponsors of this webinar, um, Green Mountain Self Advocates, the Organization on Autism Research, and by um, the uh, Health Resources Service Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health through the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health Grant. All right, so tonight's topic, Tomatoes and Peppers by Matt Mulligan. And so Tomatoes and Peppers, um, I first read a few years ago, um, and uh, actually it was, it was my occupational therapist. Uh, I was, I was uh, at, at, at OT, and my therapist said, you know, I got this book you got to read. Um, it's this book, um, you know, that it, it, it's, it's all about how the environment impacts people. What? Um, so I read this, so I, I like, you know, started thumbing through it. I was like, this, I need to meet this person, this Matt Mulligan. Who is this? <laughs> I don't know if you know that story, Matt. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we met Matt Mulligan, and Matt Mulligan joined us for Brain Club uh, uh, um, exactly two years ago. I think it was like June or July of 2022. We're so, so excited to welcome you back. Um, so not only is Matt the author of this incredible book that he'll read to us today, uh, but he is a community-based mental health counselor and now chair of the All Brains Belong Board of Directors. And so, Matt, hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I wanted to start by reading the book, but I... I... I uh, wanted to open a little window into my own neurodivergent world. Um, right now, I do not own a copy of my own book, um, just because of the way things are. And um, so I'm using the um, uh, the ebook that I had created, and um, I had never opened the ebook um, on Kindle. And I hate the format that it's in. So now I'm going to change the format because I don't find it very accessible. Um, but I do have it in front of me. I can read it and and I will do so. And then um, I look forward to talking about it. Um, I always like to include the dedication. Um, be to Mom and to Sonia, who is my best friend since I was 17. Um, who both played a huge part in the growth of this tomato. Um, my mother was instrumental in 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 uh, supporting me through um, 
I don't know, tens and tens of surgeries as a kid. And, and she always reminded me what I could do. And, um, uh, so I owe a lot to her and, uh, I like to point that out. And Sonia, um, this book would not exist without her excellent, um, project management skills, um, because the sequences, um, are one of my struggles and, um, and sequences that are complex or seemingly unrelated are even greater. And so, um, yes, this book would not exist without her. So, um, let me just read. So uh, spring has arrived and it's time to plant your garden. You go to the nursery and you pick out two seedlings, a tomato plant and a pepper plant. You plant them in good soil in a spot that will get lots of sun. You keep a watering can nearby in case they need extra water. You find a trowel to dig up any weeds that may pop up along the way. Then your work is done. Then you remember that you need a cage for the tomato plant. Even though it's a seedling, you can place the cage now to give it the extra support it needs as it grows. Pepper plants don't need the extra support. Their limbs are stronger and their fruit is lighter. You might need to stake it, then it will do fine. Tomato plants, however, have skinnier limbs and heavier fruit, and so, without the right support, the tomatoes will bend or even break the plant. They might grow in the dirt and spoil. We provide different supports for each plant without a second thought. Do we blame the tomato plant because it needs extra support to produce good fruit? Nope. Do we question the character of the tomato plant because it needs more support as it grows? Nope. Do we believe that there is something wrong with the tomato plant because it struggles to carry its heavier load? Nope. Do we believe that there is something wrong with the tomato because it weighs the plant down? Nope. We don't criticize the tomato plant for not being able to carry the load, and we don't criticize the tomato for being too heavy. We simply anticipate the need based on what we know about the tomato and the plant, and understand that if they end up in the dirt, we are to blame. We do not label it as different in some way. We do not blame the seed it grew from. We don't blame the ground in which the seed grew. We simply give it the support it needs. On the counter in the kitchen, you see a pepper and tomato. You don't think twice about how they got there fully grown. Their seedlings have the same potential with differing outcomes and different needs for support. Our communities are filled with seedlings that become tomatoes and peppers. Why can't we care for our children the way we care for these plants? Why can't we see our children? We, we need to. Their potential and growth are our work, and with the right supports, an abundant harvest our promise to keep. And I love this book more and more every time I read it or hear it. And there's lots, lots of love for you in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Can you? Oh, thank tell, you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of I love this. I love this. I love this. Um, which I love this too. <laughs> um, I, I, I can, can, yeah. can you, you know, can you share what you as the author, what are you hoping people take away from this book? Um, I think I think there's an essential question in in the world we live in, and um, it is directed toward people, 
And so much of the, the question goes to the idea of how do we fix that? Um, and I would like to see the essential question changed from how do we fix it to how can we help? Just letting that sink in. Right, because that that where do we, how do I fix it? That's the message, right? Like the, 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 that, that's the message that so many people are getting from a very, very young age. And I think that that narrative is, is, is driven by the healthcare system, perpetuated by the education system. Like it's, it's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. How do I fix it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> because, you know, reimbursement in, in uh, education and in medicine it's it's all based on how to per, uh, to fix perceived deficits. Yeah. And yeah. difference is not a deficit. Um, I never knew. Um, I use my left hand to write, and I play sports very badly with my right hand, and. Um, I never understood what it was. And then I found the term cross dominant. And then I read the medical definition of being cross dominant. And it said it was based on an immature, um, confused brain that um, that is inefficient. And I'm like, oh, isn't that so expected? <laughs> when I always just thought it was a sort of superpower. Classic, right? Classic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, I I would imagine that your personal experiences and the messages that you've gotten throughout your life, I imagine mm -hmm. that that in in some way like contributed to you deciding to write this book. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, I, I say I don't blame anybody. Um, I was not diagnosed with my learning disability till I was forty two years old. Um, and then I got accommodations, um, learning got much easier and I got a master's degree. Um, but in every year before that, um, when I, um, was in school, it was always, you know, why can't you learn this? Why don't you work harder? You know, are you lazy? Uh, you know, what, what is wrong? What is wrong with you? And, and I, and I, that those were a lot of the messages I heard. Of course, it's not all of them. I had wonderfully supportive people in my life too, but our brain stores the negative <laughs> in a way that um, that uh, puts it right out front. And um, um, but at the same time, you know, I was I grew up in the seventies and eighties. Like you know, cigarettes might have been healthy. Seatbelts were still new in the seventies, and we still had leaded gas. So um, we we have you know that was the world that I that I was formed in, um, um, and so and I like who I am very much. So um, um, it's 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 the thing though. As I look around the world now, we know so much more. But those very simple explanations that are so easy for our brain and so easy to access um, still leave people apologizing for themselves and their ideas. And um, that's what I would like to see change. So, you know, I would imagine that that this business of like the, you know, what what happens if the tomato were to be blamed and, you know, all, all of that, the things we don't do, um, mm -hmm. you know, the things that are being done to people, um, yep. you know, what, what's the connection between what you see as a mental health therapist and, 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 and the metaphor you use in this book? Um, as a therapist, um the need to fit in is so fiercely part of who we are as humans and and our ability to observe and note differences in our um, environment is is just as embedded it was how we survived in the wild for 
thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, so difference and belonging, um, they, yeah, they, they don't go together fundamentally. And so, um, to make it very precise as a, as a mental health, um, clinician, when I'm working with people, either people who are feeling other, um, or, or being othered, um, I like to talk about considering what we are thinking before we speak or act. And it seems like a simple notion, but it is so ingrained in us. We notice everything and that's absolutely okay. It's a hundred percent of, of who we are as humans. It's the space after the noticing where so much work can be done. And, and, and the ideas that people develop about themselves because they are noticed can also be shifted. And so that's, that's where I see the work. Yeah. It's hard though, right? Because depending oh. on, depending on the environment that you're in <laughs> and you know, how, mm -hmm. how, how, how much of a mismatch your soil is for your growth, yeah. right? If yeah. there, you may not even have access to the parts of your brain that allow you to pause. No. Oh no. Well, you don't because it's about, you know, there's, there's survival happening. It is, it is. And, you know, I always said, I, I think it's a, 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 imagine a world where a baby was born with a fully developed brain. I don't know if that would be good, but we endure so much before we can process it, before we have perspective. And, um, and so, you know, we live through these experiences as children, we, we adapt to make it through. And then those childhood adaptations that worked brilliantly, um, you know, the cruel trick is they suddenly stop working. And then we are living as adults, where we are never to blame what, uh, for what happens to us when we are children, we eventually need to take responsibility for it. hard right because if if you got blamed for being a tomato um mm -hmm. you you that's going to impact someone's sense of of agency of you know yes any degree of 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 yes of and then and then you have the systems in the world <laughs> that are normative and fixed and and um, continue to just roll on like everybody's a pepper. And then you have the people that have learned to be small and apologize for themselves to make it through. And so um, what I have learned, what All Brains Belong has taught me, um, I always said, um, oh, it's not a disability, it's just a difference. And um, now um, I won't stop talking about my disability. I know that my disability is part of me. And I know that when I lean in to my disability, it's where the ground is most solid under my feet. Um, that is the, that is the, switch that was flipped um what it's the main thing that all brains belong has done for me um i see my life through a whole new lens just want to let that sink in but it's like part of the part of the unlearning for so many people so not only um do we have tomatoes recognizing like what do you it just shamed me for being a tomato <laughs> and didn't give me the, the cage and didn't give me the right acidity of my soil. Like, what do you mean mm -hmm. we did that? Right. Mm -hmm. but, but then on top mm -hmm. of that to say, you know, what aspects of discovering my identity as a tomato, like, yep. like, like, how do you, how, how 
the, all the barriers that interfere with truly understanding one's tomato ness mm -hmm. comes from like what, you know, so much of the ableism and the internalized ableism that has set mm -hmm. in for all these decades, right? So like mm -hmm. disability means something, something to a lot of people um, yes. that, that, that is associated with something that is bad, right? And that yep. is, that, that's ableism. Um, yes. And, and so what I can, uh, another thing I've learned, my ability doesn't end where my disability begins. My abilities begin with my disability. And that's why when I'm, when I've taken on larger systems um, and a lack of equity or lack of access, um, um, I learned the term from you, the oblique angle. Um, um, people rarely see me coming <laughs> and then I'm calling them and I'm speaking to them and, and I hear how they pause. And, um, that is the superpower. That is the impact that every one of us who processes the world or learns differently enough to be considered neurodivergent. Um, um, we know the way and, um, and we can lead. And being part of a community to, to, to shift one's own self narrative to, to, to get you to that, to that place where you recognize that I think is, is, is huge. huge. I want to read for you some comments in the chat and uh, see what you'd, you'd say in response to these. Um, mm -hmm. So Sierra says, if I think I'm wrong for being a tomato and I push myself so hard to live in a world as a pepper, I might have the same view toward other tomatoes and think, quote, I've lived as a pepper. Other people just need to push through and live like a pepper. Yes, um, you can choose to do that. <laughs> um, um, but wow, is that I, I feel, I, you know, just what comes up in me personally, it just sounds so hard. And and um and that's the way i lived for a very long time and it never worked <laughs> yes right it never it never worked right. and the freedom that i've found and the strength the freedom and the strength leaning into my disability and leading with it um I, I, you know, that is a choice. That is a choice of how to live your life. And I'm not here to tell anybody how to live theirs. Um, but personally, I will, well, I can't go back. That door has closed. Right, right. And I think that when it comes to learning about some of these things, it requires so much unlearning and so much, you know, really unpacking that internalized ableism, because the whole trying to live like a pepper thing, that's, society bred that right so yeah. so when you recognize it and you know can can it, it's one thing but it's like when it creeps up on you that you don't recognize that it's happening we did a we did a brain club a couple of weeks ago with um, mm -hmm. our we had panelists talking about their their own journey of exploring internalized ableism was pretty powerful mm -hmm. all right i'm gonna read you another comment so sure. Molly says, I work in the schools. We're constantly writing and talking about, quote, accommodations. It would be just wonderful if everyone could just get what they need when they need it without having to do something different. If it were just built into the environment naturally, it would be fantastic. So Molly, you're talking about universal design. Absolutely. Yeah. Like what a world we would live in if we had universal design everywhere. If if universal design existed everywhere and was commonplace and was something most importantly that we were very used to, um, again, you know, um, the question would simply be, what do you need uh, for, for someone who is old enough to answer the question? And I always say when, when you're, uh, when anyone is working with a child and the, um, the child can't explain and the adults can't understand, um, then it's time to get a third set of eyes. 
before uh-huh. I knew I was autistic and I was an allegedly, um, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about my brain at all, but like, so yeah. I'm a parent of a, you know, a then three-year-old uh, multiply neurodivergent child and uh, a, non, a non-speaking non child at that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the thing that was the most helpful thing for me was, well, they did two things at the same time. One is I spent a lot of time reading, um, you know, blogs and watching vlogs and reading books of autistic creators. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got a, uh, a, a an autistic family therapist Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that combination of things to help me understand a lens to understand my child's behavior. And Mm -hmm. then like everything I learned, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I didn't realize it's because I, my brain works very similar to my child. It like took later, Mm -hmm. I think to Sierra's point in the chat, when many of us are in burnout, many of us realize we're tomatoes. Once we lose the ability to live as peppers, that's, Mm -hmm. that was certainly my experience. That is so well said. Yes. Uh Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I absolutely agree. It's it's the lens of understanding. Yes, um, the lens of understanding. And I love that story so much um, that you just shared, Mel, because it is, it is, um, we are, um, any diagnosis, we, our personhood, our self is something that is completely separate from and And um, we can see ourselves as ourselves and then understand that there are things that are in relation with us, but that, you know, um, when I can't remember the, um, you know, which key to use at which door, I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's because of the way my brain works. It's not it's not something bad about me. It's just what my brain does. It just is. And it and I think that's, and, and so, you know, to, to, when, when you said before that, you know, leaning in to your identity as it relates to your disability is where the solid ground is, right? It just yes. is. It just is that I need to label my keys. It, yes. it just is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is, it's bedrock. It is, um, you know, I'm getting chills um, just talking about it. Because, um, you know, uh, I'm going, Wendell Berry is, uh, wrote my favorite poem ever. And, um, and I'm going to, uh, it's really quick, too. It says, the world cannot be discovered by a journey of miles, no matter how many. It's a journey of one inch, arduous, humbling, and joyful, where I arrive at the ground at my feet and learn to be home. And, and that's it. I mean, you know, I don't want to boil my entire profession down to, you know, one, one, uh, one poem, but it's what we're all looking for, the ground under our feet. And I found it. I found it by embracing everything that I am, everything that I always have been. And, um, and I, I just threw away the part where I felt bad about it. And that's that's why I love, that's why I love working with people, um, um, you know, on their relationship to their experience, um, because often our relationships with our experience are formed by external opinions and assumptions, you know, and, um, and those become facts in our head. And, um, and then the work in adulthood is to unlearn them. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and Sierra just responded to that. Uh, I just threw away the part that felt bad about it. Yep. Uh, so there's a comment in the chat. Um, so this is, this, this is, you know, obviously when we think about the quote tomato identity, this is like, you know, yep. this is, this is, this is any difference, right. That is pathologized. Yes. Um, uh, so, so, but, but, uh, Laura's talking about how in the setting of autism, um, mm-hmm. that often, often, um, uh, there's, you know, com- conflict, um, around when there, when there, when there's anyone who's like trying to, you know, own the tomato identity and withholding that identity from others that can bring about self-doubt, almost mm-hmm. like imposter syndrome about who is allowed to own a disability identity is what is, is what Laura's talking about. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you think about the disability identity and um, the, the experience of people feeling like they don't get to claim it? I hear that a lot from a lot of people. Well, isn't that isn't that the normative world at work? Isn't that the story they want us to believe? Um, you know, I I um, I have a learning disability. It has no label. <laughs> and so I don't even have a, I don't know when I'm talking to the world about it. Um, I have, I have a learning disability that's, you know, based on 19 neurosurgeries, um, being born at 28 weeks and, um, and, uh, meningitis, um, after I was born probably had something to do with it too. And, um, um, it is not easy to explain. I don't have an acronym. I don't have anything. Um, I just have to say, like, I'm terrible at puzzles and anything that resembles a puzzle or Latin with all those little endings on the words. That was a nightmare. And some people find such, you know, the chart. It's just, I remember my Latin professor, it's just the chart, Matt. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, no. And sequences are hard. And if I have too many, if my errands on a Saturday are too um, divergent from each other, oh, I have to make a list because I can't go buy ice cream and a screwdriver um, uh, uh, because it just doesn't stick in my brain. But then if I look at a really complex problem, um, or or I'm I'm just in conversation with another human. Um, my brain wraps right around to that, and I can see it clearly in a way that a lot of other people can't. So you know, um, I can't. There's no there's no short way to explain how my brain's different. My brain stem twists like a fancy lollipop going up a stick. <laughs> I mean, um, it's not supposed to be that way. The neurosurgeon said so. <laughs> and 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 your journey of embracing that that just is that just yes. is yes yeah. the neurosurgeon the neurosurgeon even said you know uh, the medical textbooks you know they might say that um birth at 28 weeks or earlier you know you could have very well survived um you know being born too early and he's like is that upsetting and i said no because clearly i just can't um I can't die. I just, I just keep on living and keep on going. And so, um, um, you know, it's, it's been a journey from the very, very, very beginning. And, um, and I'm very pleased to be, um, where I am and I'm very pleased to be who I am. So, um, everything I've gone through, um, every single thing has been worth it. Thank you for sharing that. That's mm -hmm. that's really something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a question in the chat. Sure. Can you tell us how you came to choose to write the book in analogies regarding the tomato and pepper? Um, I was driving to my internship. I was almost to White River. And I don't know why, but my brain just turns away at things. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, a tomato and a pepper. And I was like, oh. And I arrived at my internship, and I sat down on a, with a pad of paper, and I wrote the story. Now, what I understand, I didn't choose to write the story in any way. There wasn't any preconceived notion. The story just came out of me. What I, what I see as the real value in the story and the way that it is written is that um, I believe, I think people have said to me that they learn something new um, before they realize they've learned something. And so sometimes people get angry after they read the book. Um, sometimes people feel um, insulted. Um, sometimes well people feel great joy or relief there's a there's a spectrum of emotions that that um, people experience after they read the book but regardless of what they feel after they've read the book they've already learned the message 
Oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. So, so, so people can react in any, in any, in, in, a, in a wide variety of ways, but internalizing mm -hmm. the message is what's most important. Yeah. Well, and, and yes, and, and that's, I think what happens automatically. And I remember I had a woman, uh, she asked me, she's like, so what exactly do you mean? You know, if the tomato ends up in the dirt, we're to blame. And I said, well, I mean exactly that because they're children <laughs> and they depend on adults to scaffold their experience in a way that makes makes the makes the step from what they know to uh, to what they're about to know easier. So is that new information you think to some for some, some adults? that you yeah. interface with yeah like new information like i as the adult as a helping professional my job yep. is to scaffold the children that's like yeah. new information to people mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well and i think you know in the wake of of the pandemic and um and its impact on public education and um you know i see um that that question, you know, what do you need? Um, I, I was actually thinking about that today, and how um, and how I think the question now um, not only does it apply to students, what do you need, um, but teachers, what do you need? How how are you you know i might be biased but how are you exploring your relationship to this whole new experience in your in your work and in your role because it's not instructional anymore i mean it is but it's not just instruction it is you know um it's like any public entity now the public library here in barry i know i've heard people talk about it public school any 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 public institution um mental health and awareness of its impact um uh the pandemic brought that right to the surface and so um you know that that idea that i talk about you know um asking somebody what's your relationship with their experience um sometimes people don't know there is one and there is so um so I like to think, because I know some brilliant educators, I've watched um, teaching, instruction is an art form. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Um, but I worry about, you know, the pressures on the system and its impact on everybody. Oh, you... You, you know, like the the systemic factors that make it so that the story of the pink pen happens. Mm -hmm. You know the story of the pink pen, don't you? I, I don't. Oh, it sounds like a great time to tell it at Brain Club. Yes. So um, once upon a time, um, I was uh, attending um, one of my uh, community members' um, school meetings. Mm hmm where um, one of the professionals uh, present, and again, system, right? No one, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I think if I'm gonna tell this story, it's with the premise that this yeah. is not any, any, any fault of an individual. It's the no. system that yeah. they, just like in healthcare where, you know, mm -hmm. clinicians don't have their access needs. You know, I think educators yeah. have the hardest job in the world. I can't imagine what it's like to spend all day in an environment mm -hmm. where they are thwarted. Mm -hmm. um, and the feedback that my uh, patient was given was that um, they are inflexible because they <laughs> insist on using pink pen. Mm. And the, 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 the person giving feedback uses a red pen to grade papers. Mm -hmm. And when the child uses a pink pen, the mm -hmm. adult has to change pens. Hmm. Hmm. You know, um, I think about that in two ways um, because I, I, I work in a school and um, 
but the problem isn't the pen. You know, it's funny. All brains belong has helped me understand what are conflicting access needs. They're everywhere. Um, maybe that teacher, um, when they look at pink ink on paper, they can't. It's hard for them to read. That 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 first that that's the first thing that came into my head. Um, the second one is that systems are you know are so rigid. Um, no, you use blue or black ink, and it could be that simple. But you know, all brains belong has helped me understand that that teacher might have a really hard time looking at pink ink and not know it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so in fact, um, uh, when when uh, dur during during in real time in the story of the of the of the pink pen, um, mm -hmm. my res my response was, it sounds like we have a conflicting access need situation oh. here. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. And what did what was the response to that? Do people did people even know what you were speaking of? No, but the child did, and that's all that oh. I cared about. The okay. child did not internalize that there was something wrong with them. Um, they're a tomato and yeah. they need a pink pen mm -hmm. and that's just how that's going to go. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and then, you know, but if the teacher, you know, if the, or if the professional, you know, yeah, could, again, thinking about your relationship to your experience, right. It's, it's so important. And, and, you know, as a therapist, contemplative practice is what I do. I'm always thinking about what I'm thinking about. And um, and teachers are never given the opportunity to be contemplative in terms of their their own practice with a with a knowing guide. Um, and I think that would transform public education. But first, there would have to be the the system again. And I'm talking about the system it it doesn't recognize that mental health um in so many ways exists or needs right. attention um, right there's this arbitrary distinction between mental health physical health like like as this is as though those are separate things and they're not separate things no um, and yeah. and my one one um one thing that I want to bring up to somebody, and I don't know who, what I've noticed is that, you know, in public school, um, a, um, a qualifier for an IEP is something, and I knew this term before, but I, I didn't see it in this way, but the, the qualifier is simply emotional disturbance. So gross. That, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, yeah. It, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't steer anybody toward help or support it is it is pejorative it is vague and and it's in its and in in its pejorative nature and its vagueness it, it's harmful totally harmful right and so this 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 uh, you know and, and, and it's it's the opposite message, you know, so we're talking about, you know, shifting from what is wrong with you to how can I help? So to yes. tell a sweet little love that you are emotionally, emotionally disturbed? disturbed, like, are you, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, it is. And to not realize is. how traumatic that is. I don't think, because again, you know, I fall back on there, there are good people. Uh, there are so many good people out in the world of education, but the systems are so ingrained and the language and the procedures and um, they, they, the brain loves what it's used to. Healthcare too. It's the same. So all of the really gross language in the healthcare yeah. system, it's a very yep. similar uh, experience. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so speaking, speaking of this, there's a question in the chat. Um, uh, Laura says, I, I love your shift from what is wrong with you to how can I help? I'm reading a book right now about trauma informed care, talking about shifting to asking what happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, it makes, it makes me think about traumas that come from being othered throughout life. Can you speak to how you see trauma fitting into this? If at all, it's the question. Oh, I mean, um, It's it's everywhere. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever shared this story with anybody, but um, um, I have been othered my entire life because of the shape of my skull. 
And um, it was no fault of mine. I was a premium. I was, you know, in a incubator or whatever they put you in for months and months and months. And they would just roll me back and forth. And and so my my skull was a different shape. I um, I had somebody say to me one day, um, I was like, oh, no, I understand your struggle. And they said to me, oh, I don't have to look at your face twice to know that you understand. And um, um, trauma, trauma is everywhere because being other, being other essentially means that you're not safe. We're herd, we're herd animals, you know? We, we exist in packs. It's where we get our safety from. But um, if you think differently, um, you know, uh, there is no, well, it's invisible. You can't see it. So the brain of the people around those being othered just makes up their own story. And, they, and then people believe it because we need to believe our stories. That's how we stay safe. So the the individual with the individual invisible disability um, becomes subject to the assumptions and opinions of everybody who interacts with them. And so, yes, trauma is a huge part of it. But in the end, you know, as I said, it's never our fault but then it becomes our responsibility. And um, I have been working with my own trauma uh, for decades. And, um, and well, I mean, it's just intrinsically part of who I am. So I, um, I want to say absolutely yes. But what I said, I was at a hydrocephalus conference. That's what I, a condition I developed after birth. And I, I somehow ended up speaking at the closing session. And so I had like 500 people in this ballroom. And I said, and I said to all the children, all the parents, I said, I want to speak to all the parents of the children um, that I've met, you know, this, these past three days. I said, you cannot keep the world from being cruel but you can help your child reach their potential, whatever that looks like. And, um, and the world and its harshness um, can be a little easier to take if you know how to climb a rock. Let's sink in. Wow. So Matt, I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, sure. If, if you can uh, uh, put put your board chair hat on, if you would, mm -hmm. um, can you can you share it all? Like your vision for neuro inclusive community, you know, a community where all brains belong. Yes. Um, and it comes down to um, the question. I wish I wish everybody could could um, slow themselves down. And um, be, for, be more familiar with their own relationship with their experience. And then when they come up against something they don't understand or they perceive there's a difference, I wish the universal fundamental question that we all ask each other all the time is how can I help? Uh, what a what a perfect way to to wrap up this conversation. I just want to read read this feedback. Um, uh, as Laura says, thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself with all of us today. This has been a really inspiring conversation. No, yeah. I um, I'm I'm grateful every time I get to talk about this because this book sprang up. Um, you know, um in my mind at the time out of nowhere, but the more that I've lived with it and the more that I've talked about it and the more that I've done my own work, um, it is the thread um, that has followed me throughout my whole life. 
and um, and working to spread that message that that <clears throat> that continuity based on different has always been with me and has always been where I'm strongest. Yeah. It's really powerful. Thank, thank, thank you. No, thank you. And so with that, everyone, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for being part of our community. And we look forward to seeing you next week where we will be joined by the research team, Dr. Laura Lewis from the University of Vermont um, and her research team talking about their experience um, uh, with a study on uh, the experiences of autistic adults with multiple health conditions and the experience of um, invalidation by the healthcare system and, and what that research uh, has, has, has borne out. Um, and so uh, we look we, it, it, another uh, we look forward to to you joining us for uh, another powerful conversation about um, really what what uh, the participants in this research um, like identified, which would have would have been helpful, helpful and therapeutic, um, which is not in fact what they actually experienced. So um, with, with, with that, uh, have a good week. We'll see you next time.